Uh, hey, Alyssa. Hey, Sam. Hey, Leanne. Hi. Are you guys both ready for today? I'm ready. I'm ready. Let's hit it. <laughs> okay, so today we have a very special guest, Leanne Charbonneau. Leanne is a longtime approachable listener. <laughs> I, I, wanted, I wanted to promote ourselves in, <laughs> in the intro. <laughs> no, no. Uh, Leanne had actually reached out to us when we did the chronic pain episode with Raw Beauty Christie, if you guys remember from, I think that was like oh, what, that was season way back. one. Yeah, that was. <laughs> um, and, and she was really moved that we were talking about chronic illness um, and it was specifically invisible illness. And Leanne, you have... Let me pull it up here. Oh. Neurofibromatosis. Yes. And Leanne has graciously agreed to come on the podcast and talk to us about NF, which is what I'll be calling it because I messed that up three <laughs> times. So sorry, Sam, editing this later. Uh, and talk about her experience uh, with invisible illness and kind of like everything that it entails. And Leanne and I had connected last week and I basically interviewed her then because I was just so moved by your story, honestly. And I was asking question after question and I was like, okay, I'll stop. <laughs> stop. And she's like, save it for the podcast, bitch. Yeah. Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah. I'll stop interrogating you. Um, so yeah, I, I did look up NF a little bit after we spoke just because I didn't want to be like completely clueless as to like what you've been going through and stuff like that. But um, why don't we kind of just jump in from the beginning? Um, when were you diagnosed with NF? Is it genetic? Uh, that sort of thing. Yeah, so um, NF, um is technically genetic but I'm the first one in the family that uh, carries the gene chromosome 17 which is mutated to give me an S. Um, I was diagnosed when I was four. My mom noticed uh, I had like what looked like swollen you can't even really see it with my hair but um, swollen lymph nodes almost so she brought me to the hospital in Toronto um, and they brought me to the cancer patient unit and my mom was freaking out because she thought that I had cancer they did a biopsy and they figured it was NF when I was four so I've been growing with it ever since and what is NF I guess in like layman's terms <laughs> general like, terms <laughs> yeah like like how does it present for you and you, you had spoke with me last week that you connected with someone else who actually had this um yeah. in Europe and maybe like the differences of how it presents in her as well not obviously like like within the parameters of privacy and stuff like that, but just like the differences, right? Yeah, well, um, it's, it's honestly, as I was telling you, it's so varied from person to person. So you have NF1, neurofibromatosis, see even me, I'm messing it up, neurofibromatosis, <laughs> uh, one, two, and schwannomatosis. So there's three different kinds. Each of three are widely varied. So it's really, really hard to find someone with similar um, symptoms or limitations, I guess you could say. Um, and as it pertains to me, I have NF1. Um, and some of them have been removed, but most of my tumors uh, grow on nerve endings. All the tumors, all NF grows on nerve endings. And mine are in my spinal cord, all around in my neck. And around my pelvic area so you can have them like just on the skin they kind of look like skin tags like if you were to google neurofibromatosis this would this would come up um i don't have any of those i am um, nf2 i'm less familiar with just because there's so there's so much information uh but that's how it is for me i've met people who do just have them on the skin I've met people who have it genetically, but it hasn't manifested in any tumor growth at all. Um, and then in England, I recently met a wonderful, beautiful girl. Um, and she unfortunately has them in her diaphragm and her lungs. Um, oh, wow. So it's, yeah. Um, the ones that grow like around the neck, around the arteries, um, in the lungs, uh, these are all plexiform. Those are the most uh, large and complicated of the tumors. And that's, of course, the only ones I have. <laughs> yeah. So. And so every single, so these tumors like continually grow over time. And then do you have to have like invasive surgery to remove it every single time? Uh, yes. Um, 
the reason I had mine removed was it was, okay, I'm going to just see if this makes sense. If not, you can cut it out. <laughs> this is my <laughs> spinal cord, right? Okay. All in here. And like my spinal cord, can you see? Like it's, it mm -hmm. was getting pressed down like this from the tumors. So it was going to cause paralysis. Um, so I had to get those removed. Sometimes they grow back. Sometimes they don't. Uh, knock on wood, mine haven't. Um, but there are cases where it does grow back. Um, mine haven't grown substantially in years, which is amazing. Uh, they usually grow at most with uh, puberty and pregnancy. So mine stopped growing. I, well, they, they grow like a millimeter every year, you know? So it's like not growing, growing. But some of them grow really fast. Some of them turn cancerous, plexiform in particular. So... Yeah, we do have to remove them when we can. And unfortunately, if it's an absolute needed surgery, um, you can remove the, the nerves with it and it can come with complications. Oh, my gosh. And you, you've you had quite a few surgeries, correct? To remove yeah. them? Yeah, I have. I've had three different ones. Uh, the first one was on my head. Not in my head. Not by my brain. On my head. Because uh, I did have tumors that you could feel from the top. I don't really know how to explain it. Um, but they were on my head. That was the first surgery. Um, my second surgery was was a lot more complicated. Uh, it was 20 hours. And they removed oh my all of my... <laughs> they removed <clears throat> as many tumors as they could. Uh, between my brain stem all the way down to my C7. So... Your spinal cord, well, your spine, is the cervical, the thoracic, and the lumbar. I had to have my entire cervical spine fused with rods and screws because my bones didn't develop properly with the tumors. <laughs> so that was a long surgery. And then basically I had the same thing at the lowest end of my lumbar. And so how old were you like, with all of these different surgeries? Uh, I didn't have surgery until 2014. Um, okay. Yeah, so it's been, yeah, it's been every couple of years. So this is, I think, I think this is the longest I've gone since then without having to need, have any surgery. So, which is really great. <laughs> Two years after I had um, my, uh, my lumbar and both of the head and the neck surgeries were in 2014. My God. Yeah. What a year that must have been. <laughs> You're like, 2020 is ain't shit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think 2020 is great for me. <laughs> yeah. um, when you were growing up, uh, I guess because the, the tumors keep growing, when you were growing up, did you have limitations that other uh, people who, you know, didn't have this chronic illness? Yeah. 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 Um... The, the doctors kind of prepared my mom and dad because of where my tumors were located that I'd have a really hard time um, even finishing elementary and high school. Um, they expected me to be paralyzed by the, like during puberty. Um, thank God that didn't happen. Um, but I did, you know, I, I, if I had hit my head, it would hurt way more or I couldn't play sports. I, I loved soccer. I used to play soccer all the time when I was a kid. Well, play i i liked picking grass <laughs> frankly <laughs> <laughs> but um I, could, I reached a certain age that i couldn't play that and which honestly i i'm not super mad i was mad then but as i started growing up i realized i was way more artistic than athletic so it kind of gave me a good excuse not to go to gym <laughs> you're like no it's fine I'm, I'm gonna make pottery <laughs> so yeah it, it, those kind of things and then kids will be kids and when I was younger I was severely bullied um but uh, yeah that, that sucked a lot but that was the hardest thing when I was a kid bullied because of your condition yeah they said I was like a giraffe, that I swallowed a rock. Um, yeah, <laughs> they, they just sucked. Horrifying. Oh, my God. Yeah. My future children, 
Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I hear you're bullying one time. Oh, so I swear to God. I swear to God. <laughs> what, um, how, I guess, I guess you can't speak for them, but how did your parents deal with that? Like you coming home and telling them that you were getting bullied for something that obviously you just, you know, as part of your life. I, I, I can't imagine. Um, my mom and dad, when it came to this stuff, geez, they had such a perfect balance of giving me like the truth and facts and being realistic without it causing stress somehow. (laughs) Yeah. Like how (laughs) I'm trying to think of how you would even make that. (laughs) But, um, they, they, my mom, when I got older, told me that it really broke her heart. Um, (laughs) I have a younger brother, bless him. When he started taking the bus with me to school, because we went to the same school at some point, um, people were bullying bullying me. He's five years younger than me. And, like, you know, like, as you get older, you sit at the back of the bus kind of thing. He was sitting way at the front, and I was sitting somewhere. And people were bullying me. (laughs) And he stood up, and he came back, and he yelled at them to stop. Oh. <laughs> I know my brother's so sweet. <laughs> oh my god, what an angel! Yeah, yeah really. One, one time, my mom told a story that she was getting bullied, and when she told me this story, she was getting bullied on a bus. I like, I had this feeling. I was like, let me time travel and go back. And <laughs> yeah. <get> <laughs> I can't even imagine a little sweet, sweet little woman <laughs> getting bullied. <laughs> 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 I just punched the I punched the air for anyone listening <laughs> like only listening <laughs> um so I'm curious like what what does NF look f- like for you like kind of day to day like what are your like main symptoms that you kind of struggle with yeah so um day to day I always have pain in this area um it varies on severity today it's pretty good um but it feels like I'm choked all the time because of all my tumors here. Um, and sometimes it's really hot. My stamina, I was actually explaining it to someone, my girlfriend, I think. My stamina isn't very good. Um, say you start off with like, like an average person starts off with an average of like a 70% stamina for the day. I'll start off with maybe like a 30 or a 20 and so I just have to really prioritize where my energy is going and be, be frugal almost with mm. what I do. So like if I know that I'm going to be seeing my girlfriends or something, I know I can't clean that day either because I'm always having to deal with the pain. So I just have to allot my energy appropriately. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so. But uh, I, I, I'm pretty used to it by now. Uh, sometimes it's really bad. Uh, my husband is fantastic. Like sometimes like this mug, for instance, um, on my bad days, I can't bring it to my mouth. So he would, he helps me. He cooks excellently. (laughs) (laughs) Um, and, and he really takes care of me on those really bad days. But for the most part, it's, it's about balance. And then do you ever have, um, periods of time where you are kind of like more free of pain or you just notice that it's like a long longer stint of you know lesser symptoms kind of thing I wish (laughs) (laughs) uh yes but it was uh it hasn't been for a while I was getting uh treated at the neurological hospital in Montreal here um and it was called a lidocaine injection and this treatment gave me a longer spurt where I could be more energetic and more uh, active in my life. Um, but I haven't received this uh, because I kick- got kicked out of that clinic. Uh, it's the with the doctor that I was telling you about, Alyssa. Um, I haven't had this oh. in, in almost a year. So it's been, oh. uh, yeah. Um, do you want to talk about why you got kicked out of that clinic? Yeah, sure. So um, I was getting treated. I've been treated there for four years in total. Um, When I first got in, well, not even when I first got into the clinic, when my surgeon asked for me to be put in the clinic, uh, that doctor that is in the pain clinic 
uh, right away without even meeting me, prescribed me fentanyl. And that's crazy because I wasn't on any opioids at the time. Um, and then uh, when I got there, she prescribed me hydromorphone, which is synthetic morphine, um, oxycodone, um, Ativan, clonazepam, benzodiazepines. Oh. Those are benzodiazepines. Um, all at once? All at once, yeah. And wh- wh- Why? I don't know. <laughs> 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 um, and then, uh, like... I started taking more than I needed and I started finishing my prescriptions early and I went back and she was asked, I went and I was like, I finished them early. Like, I'm really sorry. And she's like, well, did it work? And I said, yeah. And she just gave me an increase in medication. Um, so I, I became addicted to, um, Oxy particularly and uh i ha- i that that lasted that like increase in medication taking more increased medication taking more lasted i think two 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 and a half years um in the end i was taking around i was cuz i was still at some point she wouldn't increase it but i kept taking more on my own which was my fault i take accountability for that Um, And in the end, I was taking upwards of 120 to 160 milligrams a day of oxycodone. Um, She, uh, at some point, decided to give me the lidocaine treatment. Um, This was after... Oh, God. Okay, no. I have to go back. So after (laughs) after the 120 milligrams a day... uh, we stopped the, the oxycodone and any other narcotics. Um, but when she did this, she said that she's going on uh, medical leave because she's getting surgery for six months. And I asked her, is there going to be another doctor that can take over my care? Because I'm seeing her a lot. And uh, she said, no, I'm going to convince them to give me opioids. So in that time, I was decreasing my uh, oxycodone and my doctor wasn't there. So I started having panic attacks all the time. Um, But my panic attacks uh, manifest almost as like body attacks. So I would have these insane muscle spasms where it looked like I was having a seizure. Um, And so that's when, after she came back, she decided to give me the lidocaine treatment. And lidocaine treatment is just an infusion for an hour. And uh, I would get that done every 8 to 12 weeks, and it would help my nerve pain. Um, In doing this, I had to take, uh, like, urine uh, test samples, urine urine tests, um, to prove that I wasn't taking any oxy. And uh, at some point, um, at some point, my family doctor prescribed me oxycodone. And I didn't know at the time, but one, one doctor uh, prescribes it to you and someone else then prescribes it to you instead. Like, it's really a bad thing. So he prescribed it to me because I was in a lot of pain. And my doctor found out and she kicks me out and that's why I'm not in the pain clinic. So it was kind of my fault. (laughs) I hold on. I hate (laughs) that. I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. Number one, (laughs) it's not your fault. (laughs) Okay. That, (laughs) and I am an expert. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) Um, I want to go back a little bit because I, I, how am I trying to say this? I respect when people can see that they have a part in their journey, for sure. But I think that there's room to understand why it was so easy to get there. Mm. Do you know what I mean? So I want to kind of go back before, and of course, only share what you're comfortable with and, and yada yada. But before you had gone to this pain clinic, had you dabbled in um, like narcotics and stuff like that before? No. How no, interesting. Never. 
it's almost as if I knew you were going to say that. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, so this is the thing is, is I'm not a doctor, of course. We all know that. But there is an issue where doctors are prescribing opioids to people without telling them how dangerous, how addictive. Um, and there's this, I could like literally go on forever with Oxy, but there are companies who literally made it seem like their opioids were not dangerous so that doctors would prescribe them more. Well, and, well, and also doctors were getting kickbacks for prescribing them, yeah. like financially. So, I mean, and then that kind of, you know, that has obviously moral implications that comes with that because it's, it is so addictive. We know it's an issue. We know it's a crisis that's happening, especially within North America right now. I just, yeah, I don't know. It, it's, it sounds like, I don't know your doctor, <laughs> but it, it sounds like it was very like recklessly kind of. Oh yeah, you absolutely. Know. Like I remember my husband at the beginning, like was just joking, but he was like, oh, she seems like the candy doctor. And then mm. there was just this flip and in doing this flip, um, it, it was almost like she was out to get me in a way. And um, she, she just, I always had to try and validate anything I was saying. So I'm in the pain clinic. The point is to manage my pain. Um, I would ask her, I don't want opioids. I don't want narcotics. Is there something we can do? <laughs> And she said, no, like she would just, she wasn't helping me at all. Um, she, she wasn't very nice <laughs> and uh, she was very dismissive. She hung up on my husband once. It was a big thing. Oh my God. Yeah. You know? I, I think that it's like a thing where we often are talking about this and I don't want to make it seem like we don't, like we have something against doctors. Um, but it is just so interesting hearing stories like this time and time again sort of thing you know well I think that it's just like with medical care like obviously you are putting your for the most part you're putting your complete trust in these people to help you yeah. because like what you 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 didn't go to school for it. you can't really help yourself so you do have to put your trust in these people and I think that that's the thing is that it's nothing against like medical staff in general but to me it's like against people who are shitty people <laughs> and yeah. shitty doctors and they're not taking the proper care and precautions and stuff like that it, it, while being in a profession that you know that people are trusting you yeah so I think that that's just you know like like basically kind of like setting you up for failure and I mean maybe maybe there wasn't any other way to like deal with your pain but I think that like she should have then been taking into account like what you were saying and like okay like how are we going to work with this alongside your concerns yeah like for me now looking back um if i knew everything that it was going to bring i would have never taken it absolutely and and that's like i don't think that it should be prescribed um for chronic pain and non-terminal patients because it does cause problems. At best, it causes hyperanalgesia, which is where your receptors um, interpret pain more sensitively. So it literally causes you to have more pain. And then so you start taking them more. And that's best case scenario. Like, I just, I just don't think it should be prescribed personally. In my personal experience, I don't right. think it, it's a good idea. I have actually heard about that before and how um, some doctors will really say to, to patients who are on like an, uh, a narcotic that we have to taper your dosage to make your pain better mm. because you get used to the, I don't know the scientific reason, but because you get used to um, the narcotic dulling the pain, it's actually making your pain worse. Um, yeah. And there's, and there's similar things with muscles when you have muscle pain, um, sometimes you actually have to strengthen in order to make the pain go away that's obviously only sometimes like there's yeah different things but we think like one thing but the the truth can be another so sort of thing but that's kind of like my whole thing is you went in there not you know <laughs> not taking narcotics and just looking for some relief and without even meeting you i that's wild to me without meeting someone to prescribe what did she prescribe you the first time sorry fentanyl <laughs> 
Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Um, My pharmacy <laughs> didn't even want to fill the, the prescription. He was like, I feel very uncomfortable doing this. You've never taken opioids before. He called me, I remember, three times that evening to make sure I was okay. Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, the time she prescribed you all of these, this slew, <laughs> you know, I mean, to me, that just sounds irresponsible, right? And then you're left here. You've not, I don't want to say wasted. That's not true. Um, but you've lived through two and a half years of your life as somebody you could because obviously when we're under the influence we're not completely ourselves right so you know you've lived through two and a half years of your life you know dealing with this and then here you are at, at on the other side of it saying I take full accountability and it's like I mean amazing that you're so you know strong that you're like okay I did this so I'm gonna get myself out of it and amazing that you did get yourself out of it but at the same time again that was a pretty shiny road that was laid there for you. Yeah. You know, with with no warning signs. You know, like they she didn't give you any and well, I mean I wasn't there. But from what you're telling <laughs> me, you know what I mean? It doesn't seem like there was a tread carefully when if if a doctor prescribed me five medications at once, I wouldn't be like, "Oh, these are probably pretty dangerous." Yeah. You know, what I mean, and the, obviously there's um there's general knowledge and stuff like that but there is this feeling of comfort when your doctor prescribes you something and initially if you start taking it uh the way that it's prescribed you're like all right it's fine but the thing with an opioid is that y it is addictive mm -hmm. so it you know what i mean it's it's a pretty easy uh easy jump there yeah. and it's so From difficult for um just in general, like there's people that get, get addicted to it uh, for acute pain, you know, like after surgery or something, the doctor will prescribe it. But for someone with chronic pain, um, if it's prescribed to you and you take it and then you stop taking it and your body's fully addicted, not only are you experiencing the negative side effects of withdrawal, but you're also dealing with it on top of your chronic pain. Right. Which is <sighs> horrible. <laughs> yeah. Well, and from the sounds of it too, correct me if I'm wrong, but it doesn't sound like there is like a ton of options for you in terms of like places to go to for pain management. So yeah, like, and it, it was difficult. Um, it's strange because the lidocaine injections that I am getting, well, was getting knock on wood, getting soon, um, were only done at this particular hospital. Um, so she would tell me like, People come like hours away to get this. I'm the only one who does it. You can't get it anywhere else. And I was thinking about it the other day and it, the mindset I had was almost that of someone in a toxic relationship where they feel like that's their only option. Mm -hmm. um, whereas just recently um, I went to our hospital here, which is much closer. And they're like, well, we can just ask for the recipe and do it here. <laughs> so which that's why I'm really hoping I get it soon yeah uh, but yeah so it was it was a strange dynamic sounds almost like a god complex to me yeah, yeah. like that for that <laughs> chick yeah yeah oh my god um and so how was this for like your husband like helping you through not only um you know like your chronic illness in general but also then like dealing with you know his spouse having to go through addiction and withdrawal and all that kind of stuff yeah, well, he's Jesus. <laughs> um, but no, he's amazing. He's he's really caring. He's gonna he's gonna be so upset that I make him sound like such a wishbone. <laughs> <laughs> he's really rough and tough. <laughs> <laughs> but he is absolutely incredible at um, helping me when I'm hurting. Uh, helping me during the withdrawals, encouraging me to keep sober. Um, it, just with everything, he's my biggest support. Um, he's my biggest cheerleader and he's my best caregiver. He's really, really amazing. The, we don't argue really about anything about this stuff and because he's just really understanding. Like even if I'm being a bitch and I'm being really mean because I'm in pain, he doesn't, he's like, okay, I, and he'll say it, we'll communicate it, and he'll say, Leanne, I know that you're doing this because you're in pain, but you still need to be nice to me. <laughs> so, you know, like, it's we have that really good dynamic, but we've also known each other 
for a really long time. So we've known each other for like 15 years. So yeah. So he's kind of no, seen, he's amazing. You, seen you go through this yeah. like, journey with your with your chronic pain and whatnot. Um, how, do you encounter people who, I mean, I, I can't imagine you don't, but who try to discredit your pain, uh, or even say that like, you don't have pain sort of thing? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I'm think I'm noticing now there's a bit of a shift where people are more understanding, but unfortunately in the past, um, I've had family members be like, well, you canceled plans on me yesterday, but now I see you're out doing stuff. So clearly you weren't in pain kind of thing. And they would get mad at me. And I'm like, well, <laughs> I don't know what to say. Um, <laughs> it's a new day. <laughs> Things are different. <laughs> and, <laughs> and then at school, I, I went to a fashion marketing school. And our last year... Um, was just uh, being in a group, coming up with a business plan and presenting it to like the CEO of Dynamite and all these Montreal um, Canadian owned businesses. And so this is like, this is the reason you go to this school is to have this final year. And I was in a group and they, they said I was lying about my pain because I wasn't coming to meetings and they, they kicked me out. And, um, which was, it, it really, it was really hard on me, um, them kicking me out, not like saying that I wasn't hurting. I would try and come up with alternatives like Skype at the time, or even just a conference call, speaker phone, something. They never, uh, did that with me. They never worked with me. They only focused on the fact that I was in that meetings. So they kicked me out. So like that was the school. Yeah, because that's, like, what do I have left after that? Like, if I'm not in the group to do the thing, then I'm just not in the school. Yeah. So it was really, uh, it took me a long time to get there, too, because it was during the time that I was getting my surgeries. So I would have to take, like, a year off and then go back to school after I recovered. And then two years again, take a year off. So this three-year course was ending up taking me like six years. And in the end, I got kicked out, which was really disheartening. Well, and that's the thing. Oh, my God, this just makes me irate. I'm like so livid on your behalf. But it's like you work just as hard, if not potentially harder, to be in that position. And we're dismissed because like it's essentially because so much of our society is not set up to um, – be helpful towards people who are basically in any position other than average yeah i like how how infuriating yeah it was it was tough (laughs) the the, i don't i I, sorry go ahead ahead. no no go ahead (laughs) the thing that always bothers me with specifically i guess like my chronic pain if you're canceling plans one day, it's almost like people think that it's like the flu where it has like a trajectory. It's like, mm-hmm. oh, this person's sick. So they're going to be sick for five to 10 days or seven to 10 days or whatever. But with chronic pain, oftentimes, you know, it can be literally debilitating one day and then it you can be able to get up and do some things the next day sort of thing. Or even for me, sometimes within like an hour, even if for me like an Advil kicks in or something like that. But in the moment that I canceled, it's like I literally couldn't get out of bed. But now an hour later, it's like, all right, well, you know, things are kind of starting to move. Um, and I am so glad that I managed to miss the... Uh, uh, narcotics train in in that way because when I was younger you know we were talking about like pain clinic sort of situation and um I was really really scared because I know how much of an addictive personality I have and I don't even know how my brain knew to say no (laughs) um but I think that you know had I maybe had I not seen so much addiction around me especially um I I think that I would have been in the exact same position that you are sort of thing um, I mean, my chronic pain, not to discredit myself, but is a very different from, you know, what you've had to go through. We spoke about that on uh, Wednesday. Um, 
but I think that it happens it happens to so many people and especially just like at the end of the day everybody just wants to feel like content you know we Mm want to like come back and we want to just be like just okay even right and and dealing with chronic pain it's like you're down here and then you you can take something that makes you feel a little better but you're not you're not coming all the way up here right you're just getting back to normal and then eventually you start taking these I know I'm going back into the opioid thing I can't like I can't let it go that I can't believe she did this to you (laughs) but you keep taking it and now you're not hitting the content anymore you're hitting down here and eventually you're like sinking lower and now you're like way back at the bottom lower than when you started and it's like how how discouraging right it, you started here and now you're all the way down here anyway I'll let it go <laughs> it makes me so sad <laughs> well and the other thing that I wanted to say too um like talking about people discrediting your pain and um and like with your relatives being like well you canceled on me yesterday and you're fine today whatever I think the other thing too is that because there's such a stigma around um like disability and illness in general and even like mental health issues and stuff like that people like go out of their way to hide them or minimize them themselves and then when the time comes that you know they're like oh, okay this is something I can't manage today then they're discredited more for it and it just kind of like is this continual cycle because like with with you Alyssa I've known you a long time but I really wasn't aware of like how serious a lot of like your um, chronic issues are until we started living together mm. um, and I remember even like we went when we were living in different provinces, um, we met up in, we flew to New York to like have like a little weekend kind of thing there. Um, and you were like, oh, I, I can't (laughs) walk around the entire city of New York all weekend because I'm in like in extreme pain. And I was like, what? (laughs) With what? (laughs) Like, like I, 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 it was, it didn't even occur to me to think about that because for so many years you had just pushed through and I'm fine and whatever and you know and then it came to a point where obviously you were like really in pain that weekend and yeah to the point where and and that's the thing too obviously like it's so different for everyone but you do just try to push through because you don't want to be a quote like air quotes burden or ruin the fun or whatever but at some point well and hold yourself back too like yeah you know want to still do things also like a really um well personally for me because I did this I, I held it away from everyone. Um, there's there's this uh, acknowledging your own pain and then being able to be vulnerable about it and understanding that when you say you're in pain, you're not immediately diminishing your self-worth. And I couldn't understand that until very recently. <laughs> mm, yeah. So for me, this is why I wouldn't tell people I was in pain when I was which is like so like again just the way that our society like treats anyone (laughs) like just how we treat each other like it's so sad that you know you're already struggling so much and then on top of that you're having to struggle with this feeling of like shame around it and needing to like keep that in which isn't you know healthy or comfortable either Mm -hmm. no and i'm just alone yeah and the thing is now though is i have a great group of friends um they're my husband's friends my friends it's a big circle and when I was getting those muscle spasms I was telling you about when my doctor was on medical leave uh they they didn't know when I wasn't in front of friends (laughs) so I was getting these muscle spasms and body spasms that I couldn't control in front of my friends and uh so they found out (laughs) yeah and they're every like I'm really, really happy because I think that that stigma is slowly changing and people are starting to understand chronic pain and invisible pain more. Um, Because my friends will always be like, oh, do you need to lay down? Do you want anything? Is there something I can do? And people want, I think, to be more accommodating, especially the ones that care about you. Yeah. Yeah. And what a change, truly, mm-hmm. you know, instead of, you know, a couple decades ago when people were like, just push through. It's like, but for what? Yeah. Fuck off. I need to just push through. <laughs> 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 Let me take a seat here real quick. <laughs> uh, 
Um, <clears throat> that I sorry, I just want to ask that lidocaine injection is that a physic like do you get physically dependent on it or no? No, you don't get physically dependent on it. How effective it is for you, uh, your body will get used to it though. So mm. it's done every eight to 12 weeks, it lasts anywhere from four to six weeks. And then you have to have a period where it's not in your system. So then you can do it again. And in this way, your body doesn't get uh, accustomed to it. So it will always be effective. And okay. it's, it's uh, starting to become one of the main treatments for nerve pain um, here anyways in Montreal um, for people who were on opioids before. Yeah. Interesting that I wonder why that wasn't the first option. I mean, again, I don't know enough to know yeah. like if it's more dangerous or something like that or or whatever because I know or if it's just newer. Yeah. There cuz there's an option for me. Um what is it? What is it? Uh it's an injection of a steroid, like a cortisone. cortisone? Yeah, I think so, cortisol injection or something, but they don't want to start it until like very very like late on kind of like when my pain is like unbearable unbearable sort of thing and like they why i also will have to have surgery but again they don't want to do that one until like you know it's absolutely we have to do it um because i think i want to say that it <laughs> i i should research things before i say it but i think that it was like <laughs> bone density or something like that like it messes with bone density and so they there's like a reason that they don't want to do it when i'm young sort of thing um and so i wonder if that's one of the the reasons for the light because i'm just again trying to wrap my brain around why her first choice was to put you on like a, a truckload of opioids <laughs> yeah this was uh this was after my neck surgery. So I'd say it was around 2016. No, before 2015. It was around 2015 that I started seeing her. Um, and I think that doctors were a lot more lax in prescribing then. So unfortunately, I was caught in the change of mentality. Right. Um, if you went to a pain clinic today they probably wouldn't prescribe opioids, you know? Yeah. Well, I don't think that it would be their first, um, their first, first option. option. Yeah. Um, I was just going to ask going back to, cause you were talking about kind of like your support group, um, within like your friend circle and your family, obviously. Um, but what, what do you feel like, you know, people can do to be more supportive to people in their life that are dealing with invisible illness or chronic pain? Um, it's, it's kind of a tough one to gauge um, because some people feel like they're being pitied kind of thing mm -hmm. if people are too caring. Um, I think the best thing you like a loved one can do, let's say, is understand what that person could benefit from, whether it is more of a sensitive approach, like a compassionate or if that person prefers to be left alone in those times, just truly understanding and not coming in with, I know how you should feel. So I'm going to make you feel that way. It's more, how do you feel and how can I help? Yeah. Kind of thing, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. That's a good point. Take the guest experience first. <laughs> <laughs> how many times can I say it? No. <laughs> But, yeah, I think that's the best way. Yeah. Well, and I think also, like, I know for me with, like, mental health and stuff like that, I notice a huge difference between people that, like, genuinely understand depression or they know, like, a little bit about it kind of thing. It's so different from somebody who has never looked it up, knows nothing about it at all kind of thing because they can't really, you know, sort of, like, assess your needs without having to constantly ask or without being like overbearing or telling you what to do or whatever kind of thing. Like, I think that it's just so different when people do have like an understanding around what you're experiencing. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. it's kind of like once the ball gets rolling and you do start um, becoming vulnerable and showing your pain to the people around you, they, they do end up learning and they do end up understanding and, and helping. That's yeah. how I like to view it anyways. <laughs> yeah, for sure. But and, and you guys can put this in the podcast, um, but it's when I 
uh, was refused opioids and stuff, um, I, I turned to self-medicating and self-medicating was cocaine. And, um, and this is, this is new. Like <laughs> it's, it's been less than a year that I've been sober. Uh, I've relapsed once. So it's been, well, I don't want to count exactly, but it's, it's been a few months, I think now that I've been sober, I, I, I come close. Like I, um, almost was nervous and uh, not on, uh, not almost, I was nervous yesterday because, um, I was talking to my husband and I was like, I kind of feel like a fraud coming in here and being like, Oh, I'm comfortable talking about chronic pain and drugs and all this stuff. But then I'm, oh, I get urges still. And he's like, no, but that just makes you be more authentic and truthful and knowing yourself. Um, but I, I got really badly into cocaine and, uh, I started lying to my husband about it. I was using, uh, money that my grandparents were sending me for financial aid towards it. Um, my best girlfriends about it. And I, I realized I had to just tell them the truth. Um, and once I told everyone the truth, I started doing meetings, uh, through zoom because of COVID. Um, and I realized how many people who have chronic pain, uh, are addicted to, to drugs. Mm -hmm. There's a huge, huge, huge correlation that I never knew about. And, uh, I, so that's, that's one of the reasons, um, I, I approached you guys actually was because it isn't something everyone talks about. I didn't, I was taking cocaine because like, you know how Alyssa, how you said like normal is here. The opioids help you come here. Cocaine helped me perform like a normal person. Um, right. it, it took away my pain. It has numbing agents. So it took away my pain. It gave me energy. It had all those euphoric effects and everything. So I felt like I could do what I needed to do. I felt like I could work on makeup looks. I could clean the house. I could do like, I didn't have to be frugal with my spending of energy. You know, I could just yeah. kind of do it all um, until I couldn't because <laughs> obviously it has really bad aspects to it. Um, and I just, it was ruining my marriage. It was ruining our finances. So I had to stop. Um, so I stopped. I'm happy I did because it was not something I was comfortable doing. Uh, I hated doing it. It uh, took away something of my personality because I always felt bad and guilty and stuff. Um, I don't know what else to say about that. but It was yeah. really a, a hard time that I'm still coming out of. I mean, just to be clear, first of all, you're definitely like not an imposter for that or anything like and and addiction like we know is a continual journey and and it's something that does ebb and flow and um you know it does often correlate to things that you're going through in your life and so i'm not surprised with the correlation of um you know chronic pain and addiction even slightly like that makes perfect sense to me um and it's nothing to be like ashamed of or feel you know any type of way about because it just it just is what it is and you're continuing to pull yourself back out of it and you do have your support system and stuff like that and that's like the main thing like it's just mm -hmm. you know it's it's an illness like anything else yeah and like i i'm very very close with my grandparents um i'm very close with my mom and dad and i told everyone in my close circle cuz i use everyone in my close circle um I'm so ha lucky. I'm so, so lucky that my husband is so understanding <laughs> because um, he, he, he got it. He understood and he's encouraging me. Like I said, he, he encourages me to stay sober. If I have urges, he said, come to me. Like, we'll talk it out. Like, I just want you to stay sober. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Obviously. But it's, it, he's, he's my angel. Truly, my husband. I... He, he's give, I don't want to get cheesy, but he's given me so much strength or he's 
he's shown me the strength I've always had because I want to say he's given it to me. I've always had my strength, but, mm-hmm. but yeah. he, he he's helped me show that I do have it, which, which not everyone has. Everyone has strength, but not everyone. Has. Yeah. yeah. Well, and it's, I mean, it's proven that support is so vital in recovery. And yeah. so, yeah, that, I mean, that doesn't surprise me either. The addiction that I had, uh, particularly to cocaine, um, the come downs are very rough, as people say. And I, at, like, at the peak of it, um, I was feeling so guilty that I would be, like, I, I, I self-harmed. I cut myself. I, I tried to kill myself. Um, once I did that, uh, when, cause I started using cocaine once the opioids were gone, uh, not right away. It took some time. Um, but I was still in the pain clinic when I was using cocaine. Um, and so one time when I got kicked out, um, I decided that I was going to use, um, And then I felt bad and I I cut my wrist and I I tried to kill myself. And my husband woke up. (laughs) My husband woke up to see me like this. And she had to clean the bathroom (sighs) because it was a mess. And it just, it, it, it doesn't bring out the best parts. And it's, it's crazy because I feel like if I never took, because I was so anti-drug before, <laughs> ironically, if I never took something that was addictive, I, I, I still, to this day, I don't think I would have, have done drugs. At first, I, I was against weed. Like, I hated people. Not I hated people that smoked weed, but I just didn't like being around it. Mm-hmm. And then, like, one thing led to another, and there I was. <laughs> Yeah. So. And how how are you dealing with men- your mental health now, now that you're sober? Um, well, it's it's a work in progress. Um, I with when I have like my really bad pain days and stuff, after a few days if it doesn't improve, I get real depressed. Um, I and just just in general, I get depressed because I'm like, well, this is the best I'm going to feel. <laughs> like, what's my va- Like, what's my? How? What is it? Like, um, worthwhile? Not my worth, but uh, quality of life. Mm. Like, this. This is supposed to be my best point of quality of life. Yeah. So, ha- and I've had these conversations with my family. Like, at some point, if my quality of life is just not good enough, they'll understand. Um, and it's just like these thoughts that are going in and out of my head when I'm depressed. Um, I get very anxious. Uh, this I'm, I'm working on too. (laughs) Um, but it's a lot easier to do because I still have the depression and the anxiety if I'm not sober. So at Mm -hmm. least now I have a sober mind and I have the people around me because if I'm not sober, I'm not sharing my depression, my anxiety with these people. Um, but being sober, I am. So not only do I have a support system to stay sober, I have a support system to support me just as a human, which I'm, I'm so blessed to have, truly. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm curious, and I don't know if you want to answer this or not, um, but you had mentioned in the beginning of the podcast about how um, with NF, it's it's kind of like the worst between um, like during puberty or during pregnancy. Um, so do, do you have kids? No. <laughs> and so I'm curious, like, does that um, are you kind of like avoiding wanting to get pregnant or have kids um, with that in mind and knowing that that could potentially diminish your quality of life as well? Um, well, honestly, I. I've known from a very young age that it would be a very hard pregnancy if I were to have kids. But 
and that's for not i don't want them <laughs> so, <laughs> so and neither does my husband you know so we're fine with that it doesn't affect me um and like my mom doesn't want me to have kids i'm not pressured by my family they're like don't have them please <laughs> so, <laughs> so we're we're gonna be able to just be kid free and like all our kids around or all our friends around us are having kids my best friend is pregnant right now and uh so you know like i love children like the classic saying i love children but i also like to leave them yeah <laughs> You like to let them go home to their parents at the That's end of the day. Yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, no, I don't want kids. If I did have kids, uh, I don't think my body could handle it. It would be very complicated. Um, and I don't envy the people who do want kids with my condition in its severity that it is. It must be tricky. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Is there anything else you kind of want to share with everyone before we let you go? Anything about... Well, uh, I think we've covered it all. Um, it is something that I'm really trying to talk about a lot, uh, invisible illnesses um, and chronic pain and invisible pain and stuff. Um, so I'm starting to try and be more active on Instagram about that. And I actually do lives for like the hour and I just talk about my situation and uh, sometimes I'll do it with someone else and we'll talk about it together or something like that. So that uh, that's the only thing, I think. But uh, yeah, I think we covered everything. Cool. And we will link for everyone watching or listening. Um, Leanne's Instagram will be linked in the description box. So if you guys want to check it out, learn some more, you guys can uh, head over there. Thanks. Thank you so much for chatting with us. I think that you are such a strong, strong woman and Thank great you. to share your story, honestly. And when I was talking to you and um, again, I like care so much about like people's privacy and I'm like, <laughs> okay, but what if you want to get a corporate job later? And like, what if you want to do this? And, you know, and I, <laughs> and I think it's, <laughs> I think it's so brave to to speak about it kind of for the betterment of all of us, right? Because we want to be as kind as we can and as helpful as we can, right? And, um, you know, if people aren't talking ab about it, I mean, yeah. But I think How people aren't talking about it because people just don't know, yeah. you know? And, and it, it's like any uh, anything. Um, the ones who have it, no one's talking about it so they're scared to talk about it and the ones right. who don't have it don't know about it because nobody's talking about it so yeah. i don't mind <laughs> yeah for better or worse so i yeah. i am talking about it and i'm talking like uh i'm i plan to talk about like chronic pain and sex and and the mental health aspects to it and everything i don't mind digging deep i think it's for the best I think hopefully it could encourage others to do it as well because yeah. the more that people know about this, the more they can help. You can't help anything if you don't know it, you know? Yeah. Well, and I do think as well that it's um, it's just admirable because I do think every extra conversation, and I think we talked about this too with um, Dr. Badali as well, but like every conversation counts towards, you know, kind of... Um, ending that stigma that we have around so many different issues that people deal with. Um, and so, yeah, I just yeah. think you're doing a great job. I'm yeah. glad that you're able to come on and share with us. Yeah, thanks so much, guys. I want to say, when I said, if people aren't talking about it, how do you know? I meant like us, like me, us people. <laughs> yeah. Like we need to be like boosting your voice sort of thing. Not like, why aren't you guys telling us you're hurt? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I realized after I said it, I was like, oh, it didn't sound, it didn't come out right. <laughs> anyway, yes. Thank you so much for your time and for being here. And it's so lovely to Oh, it's to my pleasure. You. Thank you so much for having me. All right. We will see you guys next week. We hope that you, I was going to say, we hope. I hope you learned something cool today. I don't know why I always try to cop your steez on it, you know, fun. once a month. You know, <laughs> I got a good steez to cop. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see say. you next week. <laughs> Bye, guys. Bye.